So from John Kumi, uh, we've got a few slides just saying what the climate challenge really is and what this two degree limit is about. And I've, I've really condensed this. So if you're really interested in seeing him speak, we can probably get the video from last year when he and Terry did this. I'm not sure it's one of the ones that's on YouTube right now. And as I say, you'll hear a lot about him from here. But basically, he, he does, you know, when I got interested in this back in 2006, there was still a considerable amount of dancing. Do humans cause it? Did humans not? You know. It, here it is, you know, he's, he's got up here this quote from the National Academy of Sciences years ago, 2010, just saying, you know, a strong, credible body says, you know, that this is, that this is really um, true, that the Earth system is warming, and much of the warming is very likely due to us. So, Despite the fact that the Earth's climate system goes through cycles and all of that, what we're in the middle of right now is extraordinary. And it seems, you know, the National Academy of Sciences at least says, and many more do, right, that, hey, and it's something we're doing. And one thing very remarkable, if you go back, this goes back 800,000 years is what the bottom axis is. So minus 800,000, 800,000 years ago to now. We've gone through many cycles in CO2 concentration. And you can see it bopping around between, you know, 180, 250, maybe going up a while here. It, it peaked at 300 here, uh, 300,000 years ago, bopping around, bopping around. And then you get to 1900, and something extraordinary happens. We're outside the range that we've been at before. And this was uh, a year or two ago, I think, too. Um, yeah, 2012 point. So it's even jumped farther as far as I uh, have heard. And that's really interesting. We're running an unintended experiment, it seems, on our climate. And, you know, it's because we have an atmosphere, we're not a, a very cold rock like, like the moon, right? Um, and so it makes sense that if you're changing the composition of the atmosphere, you're going to change the set point, really of that balance of where, where does your temperature equilibrate uh, when you're balancing the incoming radiation versus what's getting re-radiated. And so we've changed that set point some. Um, at least that's, that's the claim. My particular work, I don't need to take a position on that, but this seems to me very credible and very well, well stated. Um, and then we've got what happens to our gases? What's, what's going on here if the predictions it, uh, that John Kumi is quoting again, Sokolov, um, what's going to happen to our CO2, our methane, nitrous oxide, other gases, if we have no policy? So this is just the no policy case. How does it look like things go? And by the way, every plot that I've looked at since getting into this will do some sort of What's the no policy case? What was the prediction for now? And every time you look at that from, well, what actually did happen now versus what they predicted back a few years ago, we always seem to come out worse, higher. So, uh, so this is saying that by 2100, we'll be at 4.8 times pre-industrial levels. And CO2 is the greenhouse gas you hear a lot about. But methane is a stronger one. And that's natural gas, and that's uh, that's released when permafrost melts, and it's uh, you know it's it's uh, it, there's a lot of it, and so and and increasingly is the threat that there will be increasing amounts of methane too. So this isn't great, and so MIT no policy case then says well that means by 2100 we we may well be up five degrees C from the baseline, and the baseline was you know sort of historical till you know. 1900 or so, when we started taking off. Well, why do we care, right? I mean, if you're living in Canada or Alaska, you might think, gee, I'd like it to be warmer. Well, not necessarily. Um, well, I don't know what all that's about. And so the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is a UN-supervised body of scientists, I think most of them volunteer on this, put together these climate change assessments uh, every few years. And that's what a lot of these predictions come from. It's a bunch of scientists making best faith effort to have a consensus on where's climate going. And usually what they come out with uh, can strike the public as kind of alarmist, but they're doing their best to be unalarmist. They're doing their best 
to uh, make sure that they don't overstate the facts because you don't want to be accused of being alarmist. And so from those, you know, there are all these predictions. The most recent assessment report, how much CO2 has gone up, what Arctic summer sea ice extent is, what the global average upper ocean heat content is, what the global average sea level change is. So impacts that affect us, all of these. What is the global mean sea level rise thought to be? Maybe about a meter in the worst case projection. Remember, what we've seen so far is we always seem to exceed the worst case that people are, can bear to predict. Um, maybe a meter up from what it is now by the end of the century. Think what that means to so much of just this country. And then think about coastal nations, islands around the world, what's going to happen. Uh, the last time I could bear to look at it, the MIT greenhouse gamble with its no policy case. This is just a beautiful way to present probability wedges. I love this thing. Picture, picture somebody up here spinning this wheel of fortune and going ching. Oh, thank goodness. I lucked out. I'm at this less than one degree C. Hooray. But what are the chances of that? So this is what it was back a few years ago. Um, the last time I could bear to check it, this is what it had become. So everything, everything from here to here this more than 50% chances here of ending up below 3 degrees C by 2100 has now in their predictions collapsed to this teeny wedge. And now things that we didn't even dare think about, you know, well, there's a pretty decent chance we may go up by more than 7 degrees C. That's a pretty alarming prediction. That's a no policy prediction. Why do we care? Terry Root, Professor Terry Root, put together with a um, graphic artist, the uh, findings from the IPCC fourth assessment. I was just showing you some from the more recent fifth assessment. In a graphic form of why do we care if things go up, you know, a degree C, two degrees C, five degrees C. And the ones that grabbed me at that point and said, my gosh, I'm thinking about the world for my kids and here's the web of life as we know it disappearing. I thought that's not acceptable. I wonder what I can do. Um, 20 to 30 percent of known species greater risk of extinction, they say, even with that 2 degree C limit that people talk about as, well, maybe we can tolerate that. And you go upwards of that, and they're no longer saying greater risk, they're saying extinction. But there's so many more here, too. Economic global loss is up to 5 percent of the global GDP. Malnutrition, infectious diseases, droughts, you know, why, uh, lots of um, uh, wildfires, which we're seeing, increasing wildfire risk. Just Bad stuff. So that's, there's a lot of reasons why we would care. I'm now going to go from quoting some of John Kumi's slides and some of mine to quoting some of Terry Root's slides. So she specializes, she's one of the co-recipients of the Nobel Prize, being one of the lead IPCC people. Her husband, her late husband, Steve Schneider, was really prominent in understanding and getting the word out on climate change as well. They were an amazing team. And she is continuing the work. She, she is just amazing. And her specialty is looking at what climate change pressures on species are. And so, so her slides are beautifully graphic. This is what she talked about last time. And I, as I say, I can dig out that video if you guys want. I think I could probably put that on our coursework site. Um, just what are the biotic interactions? How do the species adapt to warming? What's the future? What happens when species can't adapt? Is there anything we can do? And so she put in some examples, for instance, she speaks much more eloquently than I about this, and I do have a video clip I grabbed that if we have time I could run at the end uh, at some um, conference that was just nicely concise. But she talked about, you know, the unintended consequences of doing things without complete knowledge, you know. Well, you've got wolves, and you've got coyotes, and just the interaction as you're trying to displace some species and you find, whoops, now this one's dominating and that's got a problem. The coyotes are, whoops, now the red foxes are, and oh gee, by the way, we've wiped out the wolves. You know, when humans meddle with this stuff, we really have to do it in a way that keeps in mind there are always unintended consequences. And just understand how limited our understanding is. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do anything. I devote a lot of my life to trying to develop something that I think maybe we should do, or at least have in our back pocket. But we should understand there should be an undo switch for things that we do that have um, um, ununderstood effects. What kind of adaptations can you have to climate change? What can you do? Well, 
one thing uh, that creatures do is they shift, if things are getting too hot, they shift poleward, right? They shift where it's colder, or they can go up in elevation until they run out of room. Okay, so there's some, something you can, if you can do that. But what if you are shifting, you bird who can travel, but all your food doesn't? Suddenly your ranges aren't overlapping anymore. A bird is certainly going to be able to move at a different rate than, than the vegetation that it feeds on does. And so you start getting all of these types of pressures. I don't think I left in the one. Um, there's also, you, you can end up in areas now where there's a new predator, or there's no, you know, um, it, it's just things weren't evolved that way. And so it puts enormous pressures on them when suddenly they're in a, completely different ecosystem than they evolved with. The background extinction rate historically was something like less than one species in a thousand species over a thousand years. But what it is now is one in ten species over a thousand years. So that has, instead of one in a thousand, it's gone up to one in ten, which is really alarming. Again, I'm not an expert in this, but I trust what the scientists are telling us. That's pretty alarming. That says we are just coming into the sixth, I think, great mass extinction event, unless we can do something. Um, and so what if we go up 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit now, not C? We'll expect from the IPCC assessment, 400,000 species go extinct, up 7.2, a million species go extinct. So that's pretty dire if you believe that we as humans, even if we didn't care about other species, which some of us do deeply, but even if we only cared about humans, if our web of life goes away, I think we get in trouble too. So back to John Kumi now. So that's, that's some of the effects of uh, powering back here. That's some of the effects of temperature rising. Here's a lot about extinction species. Um, what John Kumi says is, but wait, there's some hope. Um, forecasts often tell us we can't change so quickly. Basically, they don't take into account the power of innovation. And so one of the big tenets that I love in this book is that a lot of entrepreneurs working in parallel, failing forward quickly, you know, trying things, seeing what works, abandoning what doesn't work, and just keep finding, you know, designing to the right solution, that we can mm, proceed much more quickly than what an economic forecast of, well, this is existing technology, this is all we can do, would predict. And so, you know, here's, here's a sort of sobering Cal Calvin and Hobbes, right? You're packing, yep, get your toothbrush, Hobbes, we're out of here. It's an outrage how grown-ups have polluted the earth. I refuse to inherit a spoiled planet, I'm leaving. Really, where to? You know, sometimes you're a real load to have around. I was just asking, right? As people are saying, there's no planet be. And so what can we do? Well, taking again some insights from John's book, we have a lot of choices. Entrepreneurs will find opportunities in this actually. So our choices, what can we do? Our mitigation, right? You know, stop the problem. Don't emit so much CO2 or CH4. Just we can adapt. We can talk about that a little bit or we can suffer. <laughs> this is this is a quote of John Holdren's that John thinks, um, you know, he, he cites, and it's a very perceptive one. The climate problem's big, urgent, misunderstood, which means opportunity, if you're an engineer with the right mindset. And this is the thing, entrepreneurs working forward, trying things. Business needs environmentalists, and environmentalists need business, which I think is a very hopeful outlook. So this is this is really the assumption here. Um, and so what if we define, where do we need to get? What if we say we cannot exceed two degrees C, it's too dreadful if we go higher than that? Then we just start working it backwards, right? Like any engineering project. Well, okay, how many greenhouse gases can we emit? What are the pathways? What do we have to do? Try things. Don't wait for a grand climate summit of the whole world to agree, because that just doesn't seem to be happening. Um, this really is a time when individual people, corporations, enterprises taking intelligent action may have much more effect, positive effect, than these grand vision meetings, which haven't seemed to yet, right? And keep in mind that most of the infrastructure we're going to have 
a few decades from now is the stuff that gets built now, right? It's going to be between now and 2050, if we're looking at 2050. And that means changes should happen quickly. That means whatever new energy source you have, you know, it will take years to roll it out. It always takes years to adopt it. So we really have a time urgency in all of this. And so he says, immediate implementation is essential. You just can't wait and see while doing R&D. I like to make things good enough so I know they're, they're going to be safe and they have a reasonable chance of working, yes. But after that, you've got to do field testing as part of, your, part of what you're doing for real. Um, and so there's really, there's really a lot we can do. And he says, start small, think big, get going. And I think that's, that's the solution to the Calvin and Hobbes dilemma. Um, so let's get into the tricky thing of geoengineering. So this is, you know, what we just talked about could be talking about new solar cells, new transportation options, all of that. But what if we think that this long lead time says we're going to be in a heap of trouble before we can get things adopted? Do we get into geoengineering? And boy, there is a complicated topic. You guys have anything you'd like to ask or say about what we've just covered before we get into this? Because this is a heavy one. Okay. Yes. There was one estimate that only 5% of global GDP would go down after 400,000 species died, which seems Optimistic. ludicrous. Yeah, I mean, ludicrous optimism. Yeah, because yeah, if, if the level of life just collapses, we so much of what we do is built on that. I don't think 5% is really going to cut it. 5% doesn't even seem to do that. Yeah, that's a very good point. You know, there's a there's an old. Uh, I think it came from an old Doomsbury thing back uh, years ago. You have been scenarioed Rosalie. We have been scenarioed Rosalie, right? It's just a little bit angry with you when you think about it from that standpoint. Yeah. I think there's going to be a lot of suffering unless we wake up in time to do something. And I think folks like you, and that's why I'm here on a Friday afternoon, I think folks like you are the hope. Really. Um, I mean, I'll do what I can, but you're, there are more of you and you're younger. <laughs> you know, I, I think this really is something that's going to be large in your lives. And, yeah. um, geoengineering. So, your planet's having problems here, it's heating up, let's cool it. And there are so many ideas because people are creative. And, you know, it's funny because there are a certain set of people who, deny, deny, deny there's any problem, and then cling to geoengineering and say, ah, we can keep doing what we've been doing because we can fix it this way. It's really funny. Um, I, this has been pointed out to me, and you can see it. People who switch suddenly from, ah, there's no problem at all. Oh, here's the fix. And so it's, it's interesting. Just watch this conversation. Um, there's, I, I, you know, I didn't want to have you guys have to buy too many books, but this is an interesting one that Ken Caldera uses in when he teaches this, Engineering Response to Global Climate Change. And I've got a few slides in here that come from this. It's, it's a nice overview, and I'll, I'll give you a really compact overview. But the thing to watch out for in geoengineering, as in anything large, you know, the wolves, the the foxes and such, is possible unintended consequences. And if you've got those, what's your undo switch? I'm always wary when there doesn't seem to be an undo switch. So possible irreversibility, if you do find there's a dreadful side effect, well, what are you going to do about it? Um, governance, public acceptance, all of these are things that people worry about. So here are the sorts of strategies. You know, how can you stabilize the climate? Well, diminish end use energy demand. Perfect. Conservation makes so much sense in so many ways. We should be driving that as hard as we can. Produce energy without carbon emission. Absolutely. Solar, wind, you know, everything you can think of along these green lines that are in themselves economically beneficial, that just makes so much sense. Remove some gases from the atmosphere, okay, if you can. And then reduce the amount of solar radiation absorbed. That is where a lot, of, a lot of the action is in people's attempts to stabilize the climate or to think about it. So now we're in slides that are courtesy of Ken Caldera. It's very kind of him to let us do this. Um, here is something that I've, one of my favorite charts, the Earth's energy balance. 
And what I like about this is that the um, particular solution that I've been working on, I know I'm trying to alter the reflection at the surface, and I'm trying not to mess up the water cycle. Uh-oh. <laughs> Can you write me a summary on the rest of it later? Thank you. Um, so those, those are some areas where you can start trying to interact. Some are trying to change the chemical composition, so change this part of it. Some are trying to make more clouds or put in aerosols. So you can see this is just a beautiful thing. This is from, uh, this is from uh, Steve Schneider talk, and it's from Keel and Trenberth. So it's a classic slide. Um, this is from this book, The Engineering Response to Global Climate Change. It's talking about carbon dioxide removal strategies, and those are certainly ongoing, um, and solar radiation management techniques. Um, so carbon dioxide removal is brilliant. It's, it's a root cause of warming. Uh, the problem is we have a very dilute stream here <laughs> over a very large area. And even if you're trying to uh, sequester your carbon, your carbon dioxide from a smokestack, it's still rather challenging. And I am delighted that later in the quarter we have Kate Mayer, who is an expert on carbon sequestration, coming to talk to us uh, November 14th. I really want to learn what she has to tell us. Solar radiation management, a lot of things have been proposed. Um, and so this is from the Royal Society of Geoengineering report in 2009. Here's some stuff. Technology review blog in 2009, various things people are trying. Um, this is a New York Times article. And there are various of these that um, strike me as OK, and there are some of these that really worry me. Um, ones that I tend to like are ones that you could reverse. So the seawater mist, I don't have a problem with that. Floating plastic islands, mm, I'm convinced you're making a swimming pool cover there, but it's a nice idea, and you could possibly take it back out. Um, some of these are just, they strike me as nuts. I mean, trillions of orbiting solar lenses. Wow, how much energy cost are we going to have to get those up in space, and how would we take them back if we decided it was a bad idea and we'd ruined our crops? You know, it's... Um, it's a fascinating mix, but people are imaginative, and it's great that people are thinking along these lines. One set that people really like is the idea of adding stuff to our atmosphere. So stratospheric sulfate aerosol injection is a very popular one, and it's what many people mean when they talk about geoengineering. And what they say is, you know, when Mount Pinatubo erupted, things cooled off. You know, it works. And people are studying. I've been in meetings where people are studying how much it will cost to do it, you know, fixed wing versus, I mean, it just, wow, really? But the thing that worries me about this is, what's the undo switch? If we decide this is bad for some reason, how do we undo it? Well, you just wait. You know, well, it'll come out, what, with precipitation? Sulfates and rain, I think, makes sulfuric acid, which doesn't help with ocean acidification. So I worry about this. But the people who want to study this have the legitimate claim that, well, at least if we understand what the downsides will be, we'll understand it before somebody just decides, I'm going to do it because it's dire and my island is drowning and I just have to do it now. At least if we study thoroughly what the problems are, without running any tests that we couldn't undo, I, I would add, you know, it makes sense to understand. And so here are the models that they have of, well, temperature's going up, and if we squirt this in at this point, we could lower temperature pretty rapidly. And let me get to the next one, and then I will. And, but here's, here's one of those big cautions. This is one of those that if you stopped, your temperature, so let's say we decided this was a terrible idea and we wanted to stop, your temperature starts popping up much more rapidly than it would have in the first place. That is, adding, as, as this finally cleans itself out of the atmosphere, you actually pop your temperature up more quickly than you would have in the first place, putting even more pressure on species and on, and on um, sea level rise and such. So to me, this seems like a, a dangerous thing to be experimenting with at this point. Great to do paper studies, great to chase volcanoes and try to understand it. But other than that, that this is one of those that worries me because I don't see the undo switch. And you had a question. Yeah, what's the difference between sulfur dioxide emissions 
like of industry and why is it help like why doesn't it lower it from industry but it did with the volcano? In fact that's an irony that people have found. Uh, climate scientists who've really looked at this is that when I was growing up, you know, some years back, we had a lot more sulfur containing pollution in the atmosphere. And when we cleaned that up, I mean I grew up back east and Boston was often in a haze of, of pollution and it's not anymore. Um, and when they cleaned it up so much, actually things got a little bit hotter. So they actually have found that the pollution was in that strange way helping us, but you know there were so many other things it wasn't helping. So yeah, it's an excellent point. Um, so, so I say, you know, proceed with things cautiously. Understand, gee, if I stopped suddenly, again, this is Ken Calderas, he's warning us about the hazards as well. Um, but, you know, um, I would contend whatever we look at, let's be really careful about it. I love this picture, you know, what, what are we gonna carefully try? This is a fragile ecosystem we have. These guys, you guys, you know, we're all at stake here. Um, and so I contend that what we want is something that we could control if we needed to. Um, so look at this as, you know, call, call it what you will, CO2, temperature, it's just a general control diagram. Those of you who are doing controls, you know all about this. Let's say that we did something there that overcorrected, drove us into the next ice age. Well, that's not good. Um, we don't want that either. Let's say that we understand how to do and undo something. Humans will always argue about something, but I'd be delighted if what they're arguing about is what the set point should be rather than, you know, rather than something more disastrous. So this, I think, is, is a good thing. And I think people are starting to put labels on these. Steve Schneider put the label of eco-engineering on, on what I do. Um, soft geoengineering is another label. There have been whole workshops on that. Um, I think removable, reversible features are just absolutely essential. We've got to understand what we're doing well enough to be able to remove or reverse it, or we, sh or we really probably shouldn't be doing it. Um, and so now we power into what my particular thing is. So I got very concerned about polar ice, and I am fully aware that I'm an engineer. I mean, I have all decades of engineering experience. That's where my degrees are. And therefore, to get into this, I've really wanted to uh, consult with climate experts before really doing much here. And I will take you back to this ice, to this ice video that I had running earlier, if it will be kind enough to let us run. Oh, come on. Yeah. Yeah, wake up again. So this is compiled from a couple of ice researchers. I'm just going to let it run while I describe it. Oh, no, it, it wants me to describe it first. You can see the month and the year up here. So this starts actually a little before November 1979, but this is good enough. And you're looking down at the pole, at the North Pole from space, Siberia, Alaska. I was just in Barrow. We would really like to do some experiments there in Barrow last week, in fact, to scope out what it will cost to do some experiments. Here's Canada, here's Greenland. And what's really interesting about this, these two researchers, uh, Ignatius Rigger and I think it's John Wallace, put this together, was they were trying to figure out where their ice buoys were going. That's all these black and red tracks. Where are they going? Things were changing. And what they picked up from this was that reflectivity of ice has changed. And something really interesting, it's the ice albedo feedback effect that got me interested in this. That is that in the summer, We've historically been able to reflect a good deal of sunlight coming in to the north, reflecting off multi-year, very bright ice. But when you've got open ocean, most of your sunlight is absorbed. So think about 95% reflected here versus 95% absorbed. And then think further that when you've got young ice, some of you may have grown up with ice and know about glare ice, you know, you can hardly even see it's there. It can be very transparent and it can absorb a lot of sunlight still, even though there's ice there. And so what's interesting about this, just watch the pulse by month. It'll freeze back every winter. It'll disappear every summer to some extent. But just look at what's happening to the bright ice as we go along. Now we're in 1981, 83. I call this thing the 34 seconds of doom. Um, you can see people start putting out far more buoys in a little while because they're noticing something really extraordinary is happening. You can see some of the ice goes out the Fram Strait here by Greenland. But look, we're in 2000. Do you, do you remember how much ice we had before? Bright ice? We're freezing every winter, fine. But 
We don't have this bright ice anymore. And so over the last few years, what climate scientists have gone from in 2006 saying this was a responsible for about 20% of global temperature rise, this taking in more energy in the summer, more solar energy in the summer, now, that, now falling out of their models is it's about a third of global temperature rise comes from this. So I was looking for something high impact that I could work on and I seem to have found it. Um, and so that's, that's what I'm working on, is how on earth can you slow the melt or maybe even restore multi-year polar ice? And so the IPCC, when they predicted, you know, back to the IPCC fourth assessment, they had a broad range of predictions of what was going to happen to ice extent back in 2007. And this was their average, was this red line, and the blue is all the range. You know, you get a lot of scientists together, there'll be a diversity of opinion. And the black line is what actually happened. This was 2007. And then I added in... I added in the 2012 point. And so this is, this is really alarming. They, they caught that this is a positive feedback loop, but they didn't catch how fast it was going to go. And so this is just the area extent. We're down 50% from what we were in the 1979 to 1990 mean. But in volume, we're down to a quarter of what we had. We've lost three quarters of the thickness that we had of the volume. So it's not such a good situation. And then from that video with the buoys blanked out so it's easy to see, June 1980, June 2002, June 2012. So this is one of the big levers on climate change. And it's got a lot to do with just a few cities are highlighted of how much per year cities are paying to adapt. Somebody in here talked about wanting to understand adaptation. Um, this is what cities are doing. They're spending, New York City is spending right now $2 billion a year to do things that are very, yeah, that's a graphic artist's vision, we'll see, well, right? This is what people fear. Um, they're spending $2 billion a year to do very simple things, like let's make our subway system work. Let, you know, even if we have a big storm, let's have our septic outfalls come out above what our sea level is. You know, simple engineering things is very costly. And you look, um, I've been advised not to show every point you have. Many people are doing big studies on this, but if you show just a few, you can see the enormous economic impact this has already. Back to your point about GDP, right? A lot of money is going to shoring things up. And the cost right now is billions a year, but trillions are predicted after 2050 if sea levels keep rising as predicted. And, you know, this could actually be the, be the sort of things that we're worrying about in the future. Um, we also have, we've lost a rather stabilizing force in that historically the Arctic's been very, very cold compared to the rest of the world, and the jet streams have been very stable patterns. And one statement I heard at the last AGU I was at, American Geophysical Union meeting, was that over the course of human history, of civilization, the 20,000 years of civilization, we've had very stable weather patterns. These jet streams have stayed very stable, and they aren't anymore. They're wavier. It's like a small perturbation can persuade it to, can, can just be the driving force for a big shift. And so we're ending up with what people regard as weird weather, a weird weather pattern. Like we have this big drought pattern that may suddenly shift into a different pattern because things aren't that stable anymore. It makes it pretty difficult to plan where you're going to have your population centers and your coastal buildings and your crops. And so, you know, life has gotten a bit ch more challenging. And this also drives more severe storms and horrible human costs. And so we have options, right? We can do nothing. <laughs> that's, that's sort of the default option. And there are a lot of dreadful problems that people say result. We can look at these other options. Mitigation, that's going to the source, right? It's the long-term solution. This is what we absolutely should do. This is what most of you are focused on here in the class. What can I do to do a different energy solution, a different transportation solution? Heavens, yes. Um, but it's going to take a while to adopt it. And that's what worries me and keeps me motivated on what I'm doing. Here's the adaptation, the, you know, the human adaptation. Billions of dollars a year, shore up, you know, build levees, all, all this stuff. Geoengineering, here's another summation of these. Some look interesting. Some look risky. Maybe irreversible. Um, really be careful before we're implementing these, or before we're doing much in the way of testing, would be my advice. Um, 
And so, you know, my solution is to try to be as gentle as possible to reboot ice where it's melting. Do a very localized, not, not put something in the atmosphere where you're hoping you understand your wind patterns, hoping it goes the right place. Do something local. Do something you could undo. If our stuff got frozen into the ice and we couldn't remove it, okay, is it harmless? And do we have a way to melt ice? Oh yeah, soot. We are so good at soot. So I think that, you know, I think this is a rather safe thing to try, but believe me, I'm consulting with all the experts I can find to do this critical thing. First, do no harm. Um, so we've been testing for years. Um, we've had, I've been at this for about eight years, and we've done field testing for about six of them. We've had a nice test pond laboratory in, uh, in another state. We've had one in uh, California. We've had one in Canada. Uh, I've got a wonderful collaborator, Satish Chetty, who's been building these instrumentation platforms for us. He started something called a Polar Technology Conference 10 years ago that is in the NASA parking lot near here that has grown. So their last one was in Annapolis with lots and lots of people. There he is, Satish. This is Tony, whose lake I was just showing, his friend Doug, me with my, forgive me, cow cap. And six, six years of, of lab and field tests have been really critical to developing some interesting materials. And our critical questions are, what are the best materials? And how much do they slow the melt? And can we apply them maybe to help with a current problem like the drought? And I do have time to pass them around. So we have a, a little bit of a diversity of materials here. I couldn't find plastic cups when I came in. So I'm going to float one thing, but I'm thirsty. And I'm not going to drink this afterwards, although we have tested some of this on drinking water. I've never actually swallowed this. Pour a few out. And you can just see this guy floating around. This is actually um, hollow glass spheres of, of various ways, thinking that sand, floating sand, is about as harmless as you can get. We've been doing a lot of work on things like this. I don't care if Firefox had a problem and crashed. Um, and then another one, and again, plastic cups are awfully handy, but we'll just take what we got. OK, anybody worries about getting wet, you might not want to do this. Maybe I should just show it. Um, what we found is that a material that you can find in your kitchen works really well to make very bright ice. And I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but yeah, this is so much better with cups. But this is much brighter than this. Starts out than standard ice. And it is safe enough to drink, which is the next part that usually works better with a cup, but and it's it's much brighter. So it's safe stuff. And what we're trying to understand is how wet we can get our equipment here. Um, what we're trying to understand is what works best where. That particular material that makes bright ice from something that you can find in your kitchen actually hasn't worked so well in this testing out here in, in the lower 48, as opposed to glass stuff that's going around, which is one of my favorite materials. I've, we've obviously tried many materials. But um, we think it might in the Arctic, and that's part of the motivation of, well, if this is meant for the Arctic, let's try it in the Arctic. And so I was up there last week in Paro looking at what their temperatures are like, what water and air temperatures are like. What are the logistics? What's it going to cost us to do a test there? And so fundraising is a big part of what we do to, to try to get, OK, this is how much we're going to need. This is, this is how we're going to prove it. So we've gotten to this point. We think we can help with the drought. It's, it's an interesting project, and it gives me this whole lens through what we've done with, oh, your, your class, the Global Entrepreneurship and Marketing class, the Clean Tech Open, Sustainable Silicon Valley. There are a lot of accelerators now, if you have a bright idea, um, that you can try to get some help with. So that's sort of my story on trying to slow down the melt of the polar ice, um, my own environmental nonprofit. And then I wanted to just have a closing discussion here to encourage you to do a little bit of reading for next week. I'll put some of those readings about green building and about smart grid from previous 
year's lectures. Again, don't feel obligated to read all the readings, but there are some total gems up there on the coursework site if you have time. So um, in our closing discussion, we actually have a little more than seven minutes left. This is great. I talked fast. First, any questions? And then I would ask you guys to, to continue your discussions among yourselves of what's your big dream. But questions first, yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit more on how Ah, yeah, if you're good at cooling things and reflecting sunlight, then you can probably help reduce evaporation from reservoirs. And that is a really interesting fallout that we noticed early on. I had what is probably a very backwards view of things. It's like, my gosh, my problem is the polar ice melt. I mean, you look at this, this is pretty dire, and we're all right here suffering from this, right? But if you look at this affecting the entire planet at once, you say, well, there's th this is awfully urgent too. And of course, the change in weather pattern may be the cause in the drought. I don't want to be distracted from this. But this is hard to get funded. Whereas being able to preserve you know, 10 or 20% of your water supply that otherwise would have been lost is easy to, easier to fund. And so I think. It it's actually seems backwards to my original thinking, but I, I have grown. Um, I think actually we may need to make that play first, um, so that which will give us a lovely test bed to develop some of the materials we need for up here in these tougher locales. By the way, I for completely forgot to mention, I guess NASA has gotten very interested in what we're doing. We have a number of groups that are really interested that may be able to be enormously helpful that also add credibility to what we're doing, which, it, which will help us get it out there too. But yeah, that's um, some of the same materials that we're using is the idea. And uh, yeah, it could really be helpful. And now that people, isn't it funny? I mean, it's year three when people finally get it and you finally get the announcements and there's finally going to be some economic disincentive for you know, watering your lawn too much. It's like, really? Year three? I mean, I, I think the same thing has happened with the polar ice melt. You know, people are getting it now. Um, anyway, that's, yeah, that's that's what we're talking about. Um, yes? Uh, you could be in charge of deploying these technologies on the floor and maintaining it. Yes. So, so I was up there exploring who could help because, um, <laughs> um, the logistics up there are very different than around here. And there's actually um, native corporations, organizations up there. There's a, there's a lot of native people who live up there. And they have a really interesting arrangement. And they have an enormous understanding, of course, of what you have to do up there. And I went up there, I have to say, just completely ignorant. It's just, but I just have to learn about this place so I can see whether we can work up there. Because it's really important to do some on-site testing. And I kind of expected to get into town and just have, oh gosh, another scientist. They just don't understand. Ah. Instead, I really got embraced by this, no, I guess not anybody else is up there trying to save the ice and trying to reverse the melt. And so the people I was talking to were remarkable, very, very welcoming, and, and talking. One in particular was telling about how he and his dad and his brother had floated off on some ice unintendedly while they were out whale hunting, which is a big part of the culture and the economy up there, the tradition. And they were out there hunting. It was a few years ago, because this has been going on for a bit. And all of a sudden, the ice all around them melted. What, what connected them melted. And they're suddenly off there. And it's like falling off a spaceship in space without a tether. And they were pretty sure they were not going to get rescued. You know, they, and the dad is trying to do the math of, should I throw you kids across? They, you know, or, or should I go across and get out? No, we've got to stick together. You know, just by their wits trying to figure out what the right thing is with the fog raising all around them and they know they're invisible. It took them a long time for a helicopter to find them. They set the sled and all their clothes on fire trying to attract, you know, just, fortunately their dad with his last couple seconds of cell phone left a message at 911 so somebody knew roughly where they were heading. But people like that are just amazed. This, this particular person, he was amazing to talk to, um, was really amazed that the rest of the world cares about this. I mean, he knows that the buildings are falling apart because of permafrost melt. 
And he knows that hunting for whales is much more hazardous. And people, you know, put in months building these, a uh, month and a half building these straight tracks that they'll be able to escape if they need to and drag the whale back. And, you know, just all these things they do. And then the ice breaks up and they've lost that month and a half of work, the whole, you know, the whole collection of people, the whole village. And, and it's like, you care about this? And I'm just, yeah, this has an impact on the rest of the world. You know, that's, that's our angle. But they're, they're just seeing the problems in their face. So, it, you know, I hadn't understood their day-to-day -day problems. And they hadn't really gotten out of the day-to-day, -day, gee, our way of life is disappearing to, wow, this is affecting the whole world. Of course everybody cares. And so I think there's a real possibility to work together that I found really exciting. And they help you. I mean, they, they for a cost, of course, that's part of what I had to figure out was what will it cost. There are bear guards out there if you're working on the ice to help, uh, you know, shoo them away in case they decide to investigate in the wrong way. It's just a lot of, you know, how on earth do you work up there? So it's... Um, yeah, th so there's people in place who help. And there's a lot of scientific installations. Um, and yeah, I, I could go on and on about my travel memoirs. Obviously, this had made a great impression on me. Uh, but that's probably offline for, for more. But uh, yeah, work through people who live there. Anyone else? Any other questions? Yes. So is the idea to try to cover the ice with a material that you put in a water bottle? Or? That's one way to do it. Um, another way is actually, I've made sure what I work on is floatable. So if you want the highest albedo shift right away, there, there's some much brighter materials that I could bring. This is just one that's in a good size to pass around. But um, you have the highest albedo shift here. If you're going from, where was it, my friends? Ah. Uh, I guess I must have put it way back there in the ice. But you, you saw it, right? Yeah. The highest albedo shift from going to, from open ocean or very young ice to going to something very bright. And so you could float it even. But, you know, there's a lot of concern which is justifiable of how will you contain this? How will you know where it goes? How will you make sure somebody isn't eating it? How will you make sure if they do eat it, it isn't harmful? There's a lot of things you have to look at to make sure that you understand, don't cause unintended harm, and that there's an undo switch. And so those, those are the constraints. And they're pretty serious constraints. So personally, I love the one that I dare, you know, I could eat my ice cube. I, I like that a lot. But it performs beautifully in the lab. NASA has, has confirmed this on small scale. But it performed miserably in field testing on this, this uh, lake uh, in Minnesota last winter. And it's like, hmm. Very different weather patterns, but we really need to do, that's a next step, a vital next step, do a test up there and see how does it work up there in the Arctic. And, and we know why it performed miserably in, in Minnesota, but will those same conditions apply up there? Because that's the, that's the safest one. So, so if you're trying to dispersion channel in the water, how much coverage do you want? How dense do you want coverage to be? Yeah, very important. You don't want to, I used to show a slide about what the ecosystem under the ice is, because you don't want, what you really want to do is try to bring back ice-like conditions. And having all the ice gone has been an enormous eco-impact for all, all the life underneath. So you want to build it back like that. But you don't want to have, you know, some crazy plastic sheet out there or something, you know, or something that's going to block all your sunlight or all your traffic of being able to get through. So how do you reboot it with the least material you can? The thinnest material, probably fairly sparse, probably, you know, allowing a lot of traffic through um, seems the right way to go. Uh, also, to my mind, reservoirs, you know, if you're going to do this, you're probably going to want to have some parts covered at some time, but make sure they're uncovered at others so the plant life under there is going to still be thriving too. So there's a lot of constraints to respect the natural system. It's part of why people who support us sometimes wonder, why does this take so long? <laughs> it's like, well, <laughs> we're, A, we're running on a shoestring, literally a shoestring, and, and B, it's just there's a lot to consider and try to, try to make sure that we're adhering to that first do no harm. So. Any, any other questions? I think we've actually ended our time. Guys, you're a fantastic group. I really look forward to our time together this term. And please don't hesitate. Email me if you, 
if you need to, did I stick my contact info here at the end? I probably should have. Yeah. Um, there. That's how to reach me. Don't hesitate. I'm happy to do office hours and such if you need, or just to chat or just to email. Okay. Thanks a lot. And uh, do sign in and, you know, all of that. <laughs>